I know our time is back. Good morning. Will you please stand and join us in some worship today?
darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are a way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You know what? Oh. Aha, you fixed it. You're magic. Thank you. All right. So I don't know how many of you all know, but I want to introduce you to Jason Wieselmeyer. The Wieselmeyer family is often found right up here, and their son with the lovely hair is usually in the basement in my class. Uh, Dad here graduated in April with an education specialist degree in school leadership from William Woods University. He's got a future goal of taking the principal position of a building. So we need to wish him luck. And we also need to give our appreciation to him because having Christians in the leadership of our schools is such a profound mission field. I think you guys should just be super proud of Jason. Congratulations. <laughs> hey, 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 stop. Totally have to have a photo op. Luke, come on up. Uh, we're going to jump up to the lower level of the high school graduates. This is Jason and Jenny's son, Luke. And Luke will graduate from Joplin High School with his welding certification. And he's going to continue his education at Crowder College in Neosho in agriculture livestock production program to further the dream of growing Wieselmeyer Farms and Luke's lawn care service. Way to go, buddy. And two graduates was not enough for their family. They just had to be overachievers. Uh, Katie is not with us today, but Luke's big sister, Katie, let me tell you what I've learned about her. She's going to graduate on May 20th with a Master's of Healthcare Administration from Missouri State University, and she's already been hired by Cox Monet Hospital as a patient care coordinator. So congratulations, Wieselmeyer family. We're really happy for you. Darren Hayes, I saw you somewhere. Will you head up this direction? Our intern, Aiden Crable, is not able to be with us this morning because she went to celebrate her mom. Let me tell you about Aiden and her graduation and plans. She is receiving a Bachelor of Arts in Christian Ministry major um, with a children's ministry emphasis. She uh, plans to continue working here with our church during the summer, and then actually in August, she's going to go to Lexington, Kentucky for a year-long residency at Southland Christian Church, where she will serve under Lydia Proctor Florence, who is a graduate of this church here. So she is going to take what she's learned from a small church setting and go practice in a large church setting, and we are very proud of her. If you see her, make sure to encourage her this summer. And what she would really love better than a card or encouragement is if you'd sign up to help her with VBS. <laughs> Darren, come on up. Yes, All right. You guys recognize Darren. How, it, you been here all four years? Yeah. So he showed up on his first Sunday here with a little bow tie on. I thought, wow, this kid's really trying. Um, <laughs> and he's been trying hard ever since he got here. We are so thankful for Darren's investment in our students. Um, he is graduating with a Bachelor in Interdisciplinary Studies from Ozark on next Saturday. And he is graduating with a Bachelor in Social Work uh, from Missouri Southern State University, and he actually also got the Outstanding Graduate Award in Social Work. Darren has worked so hard. Um, thank you. So this next year, he's actually going to transition to online school, and he's going to be getting a master's in social work at the University of Arkansas. Uh, Darren and Abby are not sure of their plans after that, but we know that wherever they go, they're going to serve the Lord. 
and we hope they remember that they were well loved here and that we thought so much of their service, including Abby. She did an internship under Jared and she has been so involved with our young ladies and that's been a huge, huge blessing to our girls. So Darren, we love you, we're thankful for you, congratulations. So if you're following along on your blue list, actually, uh, the one who doesn't have any information about his graduation on there at all, that would be my son. And that would be because I am the principal of his school. Oops. <laughs> so uh, this is Conrad Proctor. He is Matt's and my fifth child. And he will be graduating on Thursday evening, May 19th, in our backyard between the hours of 6 to 9 p.m. If he doesn't get his homework done pretty soon, it's probably going to be closer to 9 p.m. Um, actually, there's an invitation in the hallway hanging on the bulletin board. It's been there for a few weeks. You are all invited to come party with him because nobody loves a party better than Conrad. And we would love to have you come be his school and community and help us as actually the siblings do the graduations in our family so that mom doesn't have to talk and cry. And uh, we'd be happy to have you join us for food and fireworks and just fun that night. But um, I do want to tell you, Conrad is getting ready to take off for Colorado with his brother and Caleb. They're all heading to the Colorado Christian Service Camp where Ty McCarty grew up in Como, Colorado. They're going to spend the summer out there working with kids and working on the property. And then Conrad will be returning in August to enroll at Ozark Christian College. And so congratulations, my friend. Thank you. Oh, thanks for that. One last word from the youth department side of things. It is truly a joy to see um, that the kids who grow up here walk out in faith. We don't win them all, but we win some of them. And I can tell you I have truly enjoyed having these two boys in my class for the last few years. And I have truly cherished having Darren and Abby, or, uh, Abby and Aiden working alongside us in the youth department. Central City, we are blessed with kids. Let's keep loving them as well as you already do. Thanks.
So how many of you guys have ever uh, played the game Would You Rather or heard of the game? Anyone? Okay. Yeah, all right, a few of you. Um, it's a game that, that pops up in my life every once in a while. Like, I don't adamantly say, hey, every Friday we're going to play Would You Rather with the kids or anything like that. But there are times in my life uh, where people will come up to me with a question, and they'll be like, hey, would you rather blah, 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 or would you rather blah, 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 blah. And every once in a while, I'm presented with these two options, and I'm feeling a little peppy today. So I figure we would start with a game of would you rather. So here's how this is going to work. I am going to give you two scenarios, and then you will have the opportunity to raise your hand for one or the other. Now, I will say this. You cannot abstain. <laughs> you must participate. If it's too much, you know, whoo, all right, uh, just put your head down and maybe I won't see you, all right? And so I'm going to give you two options, and then you let me know what you would rather do. So here we go. Uh, would you rather vacation in the Caribbean for the winter, so that's option one, uh, and you can think Airbnb or go on a cruise or whatever it might be for you. Would you rather do that? Or would you rather vacation in Alaska in the summer, right? So fishing for salmon and halibut and fighting bears and that whole kind of thing, all right? So Caribbean in the winter, Alaska in the summer. All right, Caribbean in the winter. All right, Alaska in the summer. Hey, that's pretty even. All right. I like that. All right, we're going to do, do another one. All right. Uh, would you rather um, eat your favorite food? food every day or have a spoonful of salt shoved into your mouth by a person that you absolutely abhor. All right, so would you rather eat your favorite food or, or have a spoonful of salt shoved into your mouth? Favorite food? Spoonful of salt. If I had to guess anywhere in the room that people would say salt, it would be in this corner of the sanctuary. All right, I, I, have, I have one more for you. Last one. Would you rather be made blind after having been able to see your entire life or be made deaf after having been able to hear your entire life? All right, so be blind after having been able to see your entire life up until that point. All right, and uh, be deaf having been able to hear your entire life up until that point. Yeah, uh, so you can see how this game gets complicated. Sometimes the choices are obvious, all right? All but like three college students were like, yeah, I want my favorite food. And then I guess salt is their favorite food over here. Uh, and then sometimes you're like, man, I got these two great things that I want to choose from. And sometimes you're like, these choices stink. Do I really have to choose one of them? Uh, in that last round, we saw that sometimes there isn't a good choice. We find ourselves forced into a position of no winning. Have you ever been in a situation where there was no winning? All right, we live in Chiefsland here. I recognize that. Whatever. I'll come. Um, but imagine you're, you're sitting down to watch football on TV on Sunday, and the game is between the Raiders and the Broncos. And you're just like, oh, and you go to change your channel, and it won't work. And you even unplug your TV, but it just stays on. And you're like, oh, my gosh. There is no winning. Nobody wants to live in a world with bad choices. But <laughs> there's a couple Broncos fans in here, aren't there? <laughs> I don't really care about professional football. I'm sorry if I offended somebody with that statement, too. <laughs> but this is the world that we find ourselves in after the death of Solomon. It is a world of bad choices. Uh, uh, you look at the nation of Israel after this point, and you're like, well, I can go with bad, or I can go with bad. It, it only took Israel two chapters to go from the pinnacle of their history, when there was more gold, where gold was as common as stone in the nation, where everything was just Great, those were the glory days before chapter 11 demonstrated the downfall of Solomon and the Lord's rebuke. 
In the end of chapter 11, it ends with, uh, with Solomon's having adversaries raised up against him. And God uh, is in a season of rebuke against him. And it is revealed that God is going to rip out from Solomon the kingdom, save for the, uh, the tribe of Judah. And so from this point, the, the lineage of Solomon, the lineage of David would be king over Judah as a reminder of God's faithfulness to David. We see that conflict and division are on the horizon. Uh, the nation is, is moving at 100 miles an hour towards civil war and the people come to learn that there is no good choice. There's no good options. They find themselves wedged not between good and bad, but bad and bad, and this is the birthing of two bad nations. It's revealed in 1 Kings chapter 12. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to open them to this point. And chapter 11 ends with Solomon sleeping with his fathers. That's code for he did, right? All right, so he has passed away, and the natural progression is what? His son should be king. That's Rehoboam. He would be king in his father's place. And that's what we see is, is beginning to happen. In verse 1 of 1 Kings 12, it says, uh, uh, Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel had come to Shechem to make him king. This was the expectation. And for everything that Solomon might have been dad, done, toward, done bad towards the end of his life, they're like, hey, you are king. Your son is going to be king. This makes sense. And Israel is for this. This is a united effort. And then all Israel came to make him king. And verse 2 says this. And as soon as Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, heard of it, for he was still in Egypt where he had fled from King Solomon, then Jeroboam returned from Egypt. Now, if you, if you flipped back to chapter 11, you will learn where Jeroboam comes from. He was a faithful servant of Solomon. Uh, and as a result of Solomon's sinfulness, the prophet Ahijah uh, approaches Jeroboam, Jeroboam in verse 11, 31. And he said to Jeroboam, Take for yourself ten pieces, for thus says the Lord, the God of Israel. Behold, I am about to tear the kingdom from the hand of Solomon, and I will give you ten tribes. And so this prophet says to Jeroboam, you're going to be king over these ten tribes. And the prophet reveals to him the same covenant uh, that he gave to David and Solomon. You know the speech by now. If you will be my servant, if you will obey, if you listen to all that I have commanded and you walk in my ways... And do what is right in my eyes by keeping my statutes and commands as my servant David did. God says, I will be with you. That's the promise that God makes to Jeroboam uh, in front of this prophet. Now Solomon must have learned of this exchange because Solomon sets out to kill Jeroboam and Jeroboam flees to Egypt. All right, so that's how he got to Egypt. That's why he is there. And after Solomon's death, he feels comfortable to return. So Jeroboam comes back, and what does he do? He doesn't declare war. He doesn't march up to uh, the gates of Rehoboam and say, you know, I am declaring war. No, all of Israel had it in their mind to make Rehoboam king. And verse 3 of 1 Kings 12 says this. And Jeroboam and all his assembly of Israel came and said to Rehoboam, your father made our yoke heavy. Now, therefore, lighten the hard service of your father and his heavy oak on us, and we will serve you. So Jeroboam gathers up the nation of Israel, and he, he pulls people in. And he says, hey, let's go make this request. Let's go talk to him. And Jeroboam leads the people in this. Now, I don't know if this is a reasonable request. I don't know if the yoke was really heavy. I don't know if the people were suffering, or I don't know if they were just whiny crybabies. I don't know if Solomon worked them too hard. I don't know that. They might be due for a rest. Perhaps Jeroboam, knowing that the kingdom or ten tribes of it is going to be given for him, is just laying a trap. He's trying to create unrest. I don't know. I do know this. It was designed by the Lord. If you read back down a little bit in your text there, you see that this was God's design. Uh, this was the intention. So however this exact test comes to pass, we don't know. What we do know this is Rehoboam hears the request, and he says, give me three days. So Jeroboam comes up and he's like, hey, uh, the people are tired, give me a break. And Rehoboam's like, all right, go take three days and come back and I'm going to think about it. And he takes counsel with the old men, his father's wise men, who advise him to heed the people's request. Verse 7 says this, and they said to him, if you, will be my ser if you will be servant to this people today and serve them and speak good words to them, when you answer them, they will be your servants forever. That's what the wise old men say. They say, hey, cut them some slack. 
Give them a break. Give them a little bit of sugar and they'll be good to go forever. They'll serve you forever. But Rehoboam abandons their counsel and he decides to listen to his drinking buddies, his childhood chums, the people that he ran around with when he was a young boy. And their advice is stick it to them. What do those people need? They're just all lazy. Uh, in fact, you should tell them that my finger is bigger than my dad's thigh and I'm the best, biggest man in the world. And so show them who's boss. And so on the third day, Rehoboam lays down the law. He declares, I am the real king. And if you thought my dad worked too hard, I'm going to show you what hard work is. And this turn of affairs is the catalyst for the great division of God's people. To the north becomes the nation of Israel. All right. So from here on out, when we hear Israel, we're thinking of the northern kingdom. To the south, that becomes the nation of Judah. And one will worship in Jerusalem. That's Judah. And the other will worship in Samaria. All right. So when you're reading the Gospels and you're seeing Jesus walk around, you hear him talking about Samaria, that's where this split comes in to play. One, that is Judah, will continue in the bloodline of David. That will be a, a Davidic king all the way up until the fall of Jerusalem. And the other will have like a bunch. <laughs> There's just a bunch of coups as different people decide to be kings. And while Judah will have a few better kings than Israel, if you were watching this play out on TV, it'd be like watching, I'm sorry, the Broncos versus the Raiders. It'd be like watching just this disaster that you have no desire to participate in. There's no good choice here. When the people find themselves isolated and lacking a national identity, it's the desert all over again. And the people's response comes in verse 16. After Rehoboam says, you do things my way, I'm going to make your life hard. This is what the people say in, in verse 16. And when all Israel saw that the king did not listen to him, the people answered the king, what portion do we have in David? We, we have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel, look now to your own house, David. So Israel went to their tents. God's holy and chosen people find themselves in a house divided. And it is tragic. It is a tragedy. Now, now this instance of division was by God's design. It, it, it was promised that the kingdom, with the exception of Judah, would be torn from Solomon's life. This is a consequence of Solomon's sin and rebellion against God, but it is not God's heart for his people to be divided. You know, we're, we're celebrating Mother's Day today, and, and I uh, had the privilege to spend some time with my mom this weekend in Nebraska. And one of the things that gives uh, my mom the greatest sorrow is when her kids are fighting. And one of the things that give her the greatest joy is when her kids get along. And so it is with God. Uh, when his children are fighting, when we are at each other's throats, and when we are, uh, are against each other, it brings great sorrow to him. It is not in his heart for us to be divided. But Israel was. And Rehoboam reigned over the people of, of Israel who lived in the cities of Judah. And, and then there was an uprising against him. All right, the people saw Rehoboam and they're like, we don't want you to be king. And so uh, out of fear, Rehoboam flees to Jerusalem. And the rest of Israel establishes Jeroboam as king. And as is the case with most divisions, the the bloody and bruised Rehoboam, he, he gathered his people. In fact, he gathered up 180,000 people, and he's like, I am going to take back my country. I am the rightful king. And then a prophet of God comes and says, that's a bad idea. If you go do that, God won't be with you. And for the first time in like this entire chapter, someone listens to God. And thankfully, Rehoboam does not go to war against Jeroboam. And so we see it is finished. The one have become two, and division is here. And you know, you remember what, what the prophet said to Jeroboam, if you, if you walk in the statutes of the Lord and you do what he asked you to do and you listen, I'll be with you. Well, we don't get very far in before Jeroboam starts screwing stuff up. In fact, uh, we get like to the beginning of his story. Out of fear of people returning to the Lord, Jeroboam builds two golden calves. What is with Israel building golden calves? I don't know. 
But Jeroboam builds two golden calves, and he tells the people of Israel, hey, you don't need to go to Jerusalem to worship. Uh, I have brought you here. In fact, you can worship these two golden calves, and, and they are the ones who brought you out of Egypt, and they are your God now. So, so don't worry about what's going on in Judah. Don't worry about what's going on in Jerusalem. You don't need to go there anymore. And I have to imagine that in Israel and in Judah, there were old men sitting around playing checkers, remembering the glory days and asking the question, how did we get here? How did we get to a kingdom in the north and a kingdom in the south? How did we get to God's nation divided? How did we get to worshiping golden calves? How did we get here? What happened to God's kingdom? What happened to David's family? What happened to us? How did it come to this? The short answer, which you might like because my sermon will be shorter, is this, rebellion. God's people and God's king rebelled against God. Solomon strayed from God and led his people away from God. But I think there's a longer answer as well, and that's what you're going to get, so you're welcome. <laughs> the longer is, I th the answer is I think there's a lesson to be learned that are vital to God's people today to his church, and yes, as an aside, I will say even to us as a nation. Division runs deep in our culture. We are indeed a house divided, more so perhaps as a country than a church. I think we can look out the doors of this place and see that, but, but I do tend to believe that there are a great many divisions in the church as well, ones that we never see. See, we have done a very good job of managing to coalesce around people of like-minded faith. And so we come into Central City and say, we are not divided. We are fine. We agree on almost everything. Okay, that's true. But there's a church across the street or across town that would believe everything opposite of what we do uh, outside of our theology. And so I would believe that there is division in the church. Is there unity between churches of... Democrats and churches of Republicans? I would tend to argue no. <laughs> so if we aren't there already, I would say we are at risk as the body of Christ of being a house divided. And while God's uh, design for Israel at that time, yes, was to be divided so there could be consequence and so the Davidic line could be preserved for the coming of, Messiah, of the Messiah. His desire for us in this moment is different. God desires with us unity. John chapter 4. Jesus encounters a Samaritan woman. Do you remember where Samaria came from? Do you remember that from earlier in the sermon? Samaritans were descendants of the nation of Israel, and Jesus engages with her, and the text says that he shares the words of life with her. And she says this in John chapter 4, verse 20. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and this is in Samaria, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where we ought to worship. And Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father, but the hour is coming coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. The Father is seeking a unified people to worship him. Whether it's in this building or whether it's in that building or wherever we are as a church, God is speaking, seeking a united church. God's heart is not for a divided church or a divided people. And if God's desire is for us to be unified, to worship in spirit and truth, if the Father is seeking such people, then we must ask the question, how do we be such people? Well, there's a long answer to that, but we'll talk about this today. For starters, we understand the forces that are used to divide us. Be on the lookout for the tools of the enemy. So for starters, division begins with a lack of understanding. Or maybe it would be better phrase this way. Division begins with a lack of empathy, of feeling what other people feel, of feeling with uh, what those who may be opposed to my world view feel. Have you ever felt misunderstood? Have you ever been accused of something that you didn't actually believe? 
it always amazed me how much more I know about other people's experiences than they do. And I'm pretty sure I'm not the only person guilty of this. I'm not the most traveled person in the world, but I have been a few places, and I know people that have been many places, and one of the things I've observed about myself and others is my tendency to think something along the lines of, why don't they just fill in the blank? Have you ever felt that? Why don't they just do this and it would solve all of their problems? Their problems aren't that complicated. Why don't they just do this? And people in the big cities and bankers and lawyers and stockbrokers, and they look at farmers and they say, it's something so simple, you put seed in the ground and it grows. Just water it. Why don't you just do that? And they're trying to trade grain futures, and, and they're just going, why doesn't the farmer just put more crop in the ground? And likewise, the farmer may look at the big city person who's having a hard time finding a job and, and, and isn't finding work, and the city person might try to explain, you know, hey, population density does affect employability. As many people live in one space, they have to travel further to work. And then the, and then the, uh, the person that lives in the, uh, in the suburbs is just like, well, why don't you just get a car and move? Why don't you just solve your problem like I suggest? You know, politicians run entire campaigns on simplifying difficult subjects. Why don't they just do this? And we eat it up because we often assume that we understand not only our own situation, but others' situations better than they do. And this leads to division. Newsflash. This leads to a great division as we get frustrated that those people don't just do the thing that you know will make their life better. Empathy and understanding creates unity by acknowledging that I might not have the insights I need to make judgments in other people's lives. And importantly, unity understands that others assume the same about us. And when we do that together, when we seek understanding of each other, when we uh, attempt to experience empathy for one another, we become united. And this was the heart of the downfall of Rehoboam, right? I mean, when he was approached uh, by the nation, give us a lighter load. We're worn out. We need a rest. And he went to the wise people and, and the old men, and they said, hey, uh, um, give them a break and they'll serve you. They asked Rehoboam's friend, and Rehoboam's friends is like, just make them work harder. They need a break. Why don't they just work harder? Why don't they just wake up earlier? I don't get it. Just go work 18 hours a day. And it's this lack of understanding and empathy that drives the 10 tribes to rebel. They don't get it. The friends live in this bubble over here and are making assumptions about everything that these people can do uh, that are down here. And the people are like, we can't do that. We are finished. Do you want to live as a unified people? Seek to understand people's lives rather than tell them how to live. Divisions occur with a lack of understanding. Division also occurs with a lack of commonality. What do you have in common with people that you disagree with? As far as understanding and empathy can get you, it is vital that we focus on the things that unite us. I'll say this. I can go to a liberal church that believes government should expand services to the poor, pursue universal health care, decrease spending for the military, tax the snot out of businesses and rich people, invest in women and women's health, support affirmative action, and still find common ground with them. In fact, risky statement, I should have more meaningful common ground with that person of faith than I should have with a non-believer who agrees with me on everything politically. Because what matters in our lives? Where is the depth? Where is the meaning? Where is the core of who we are? It is not in our political views. It is in our faith in Jesus Christ. Finding common ground can be hard when we are trained to focus on what separates us. And friends, I'll tell you this. You are being trained to focus on what separates us. The us versus them narrative of the secular world has become entrenched in our society and has infiltrated God's community. And we find us at a place where people's relationship with Christ is determined by whether they support the Second Amendment or Black Lives Matter. It's not God's heart for us to be divided by such things. And we have no recognition of our common heritage. 
And as Rehoboam makes a decision to draw the line in the sand, as he demonstrates his superiority over this lowly working class, the people of Israel, the people respond by stating, there's nothing left for us here anymore. Verse 16 says this, And when all Israel saw that the king did not listen to them, the people answered, What portion do we have in David? We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel, and to your own house, David. The people feel neglected, ignored, separated. And the desertion of the people of Israel at its heart comes from the idea that the royalty believed they were different, better, entitled. And Rehoboam and his cronies, they were a different class. And they hear the voice of Rehoboam and declare, what's left for us? Oh, how my heart breaks when people leave the church going, what's left for me here? No one understands me. No one listens to me. No one cares about me. And it breaks the heart of the Christian when people leave the church unknown. It is clear that common ground has eroded away and so came the division. And this truth has great application for the church. If you are a Christian, you have more common ground in matters of importance with Christians than you have to disagree on. Don't look down on those who are different as inferior. Embrace them in humility in the same way that Christ has embraced us. And I would mention that while I'm a preacher and speak on matters of faith, I'll throw this in for extra measure. Americans across the political spectrum have more things that unite us than separate us. We have a common heritage. And if we fail to build on our common ground, we will fail and we will falter. I got to watch the White House Correspondents' uh, Dinner. Uh, it was this week. I so appreciated the satire and the jabs against senators, governors, and the president. <laughs> that would get you imprisoned or killed in over half of the world. And that freedom to gather with people of opposing views and still value them is quintessential to who we are. Christian, this is where the tie-in is. We ought to be teaching the non-believer how to stand and united alongside people who have vastly different opinions than us. We must find our common goals, our common ethic. And as believers, yes, we certainly must worship a common God. Division occurs when we lack community, so find common ground. To my final point, I'll say this. I would argue that division occurs via manipulation. There's a lot of people that want us to be divided. I know I'm running long today, but I'll keep this short because this point is too dangerous to skip. Division occurs when we allow ourselves to be manipulated. Manipulation comes in many ways. For us, it is most often brought by the media, TV, YouTube, podcast, TikTok, you name it, all the things I don't know about yet. It's usually the media that you have decided is telling you the truth. And you know it's the truth because they told you that the other media is lying to you. Humans are quite easily manipulated. And what is fascinating is that most people in this room agree with me. But in any given room, there are two people. Both are convinced that the other person is being manipulated by the other people. We always see it in everyone else. And manipulation is difficult because it's hard to detect. We don't know when we're being manipulated. Maybe you're listening to me speak right now and you're like, is he manipulating me? Maybe. probably wouldn't be telling you if I was. It is people saying, I will give you what you want as long as you support me. And we have such a craving to be taken care of, to be part of something that we just go along with it. And one of the telltale signs of manipulation is someone giving you something that will make your life easier at no cost. Now, this is not to discount charity. Charity is real. It's important. But even with them, you must ask the question, what is the cost? While Rehoboam was trying to figure out how to lead in Judah, Israel was busy making Jeroboam king. So we've seen the faults of Rehoboam. Everything that he did that that, that led to the division of the nation of Israel. But now we move over and we meet Jeroboam, who had met the prophet of God before Solomon's death. 
and was charged with being faithful to God. This is what 1 Kings 12, 26 says. And Jeroboam said in his heart, now the kingdom will turn back to the house of David. If this people go up to offer sacrifices in the temple of the Lord at Jerusalem, then the heart of his people will turn against their, again, again to their Lord, to Rehoboam, king of Judah. And they will kill me and return to Rehoboam, king of Judah. So the king took counsel and made two calves, and he said to the people, You have gone up to Jerusalem long enough. Behold your gods, O Israel, who brought you out of Egypt. And Jeroboam, he offered an alternative God, a convenient idol that did not require them to go all the way to Jerusalem. It's true intent to separate Israel from Judah and to prevent them from returning to God. That was Jeroboam's heart and his desire to prevent the repentance of the nation of Israel and the people embittered by those others, the tribe of Judah, were given an easy out. And they took it. And in so doing, they rejected the worship of God. The world gives us all sorts of easy outs. Unrighteous leaders have it in their interest to keep us under their influence. And the media is great at offering us scapegoats, things to be angry at, other tribes, other people, other opinions, other things that are evil. And it's offering you the golden calves and saviors that ensure that we don't have to interact with those other people anymore. Or heaven forbid we find a way to make peace and move forward together. The world is offering you easy outs. They offer convenient truths that wouldn't you know it make an enemy of every fellow American and believer. Christians, we are not designed to be divided. Your mama wouldn't want it that way. We are designed to be a diverse collections of unique individuals with differing gifts and, yes, differing opinions. One of the things that I would say I love about what America evolved into was that it was a country that it was in some ways, in some ways, emulated the church. Not in all Christian doctrine, I believe in freedom of religion, but in unity with diversity. We should be demonstrating to the world what that looks like. Unity and diversity. As Christians who seek to take Paul's advice to be at peace with all people, we have the opportunity to show everyone what it is like to gather at the table together. Gun-touting, toting, police-loving, low-tax conservatives and Black Lives Matter, universal health care, tree-hugging environmentalists can share at the table together and love each other. And here's where I'll say this. We should do that. I implore us not to allow pundits, politicians, or the real enemy to drive wedges between us. We are not called to be divided. As a nation, we are one people. Okay, as a nation, all right, I can say that from the doors out here. Let's strive for that, Christian. Let's lead the way. But more importantly, as a church, we are one with Christ as he is one with the Father. Let's live this one out. In fact, I would challenge you in this. Find someone who disagrees with you on something and embrace them in Christ. There's your challenge for the week. So let us gather as one. Let us sing as one. Let us live as one and let our kingdom this diverse kingdom of God stand united. We pray with you. Lord, we thank you for diversity. As annoying as people that disagree with me might be, and God, I do find it annoying, I thank you for them. I thank you that you have called us to gather together. I thank you that you have brought us to this place together. And, and Lord, though we 
tend to dwell in homogeny, God, I pray that you give us a heart to step out of what we know and seek to grow your tent. God, I pray you give us a heart to seek and embrace those we disagree with. God, I pray you give us a heart to be united with those who differ with us. And God, we see the danger. We see the history. We see Israel and Judah. And we see after division how downhill everything goes. And we know that that danger is real. For us as a country and for us as a church, God, we know the danger is real. But God, give this church, your church, the heart to lead the way. The heart to stand arm in arm with brothers and sisters in Christ and say, we are your body and the gates of hell will not prevail against us and the weapons of the enemy will not deter or destroy us. Lord, we thank you for your son Jesus who died not just for me and not just for those in this room, but for every Christian, every person who bows the knee and says yes to you. Thank you for his death. And it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we sing this song today, I understand this was a hard message. And if you're joining us for, for Mother's Day today and you don't normally attend here, I'm not normally that harsh, but it's where we're at. And if you're finding it in your heart to say, to say, man, that kingdom sounds messy. That kingdom sounds kind of messed up or broken or that kingdom sounds like I have to talk to people I don't want to be around, but it sounds like something I want to be a part of. I want to invite you to come forward. If you haven't said yes to Jesus today, if you haven't inserted yourself in his kingdom, I want to give you an opportunity to do that. So will you stand as we sing?
a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a soul will be pierced to your own soul too. Probably not the kind of blessings Mary uh, was expecting. So, what are your thoughts today as you stand near the cross? Our thoughts and hearts are revealed to God during communion. That's why the Apostle Paul wrote, soldier pierced Jesus' side with a spear, a sword pierced Mary's soul, Calvary is a piercing experience. The Lord's Supper pierces our very soul because it reminds us Jesus was pierced for our sins. The closer I get to the cross, the more I realize the enormity of my sin. I am confronted with the fact that the cross of Jesus is all about the sins of on the day of Pentecost, Peter confronted the crowd with the message of the cross. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. They were instantly cut to the heart. So when they repented and were baptized in the name of Christ, they received forgiveness for their sins. Today we come to the table as a people who, like the 3,000 at Pentecost, have been forgiven for our sins. We are never nearer to the cross than when we partake together of the bread and cup. By faith, we look up and say, thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. In love, Jesus looks down and says, bless you, Christian, for doing this in remembrance of me. Pray together. Father in heaven, thank you so much for loving us so enormously that you sent your son pay the price for our sins, that we might spend eternity in communion with you in heaven. We are so thankful for that wonderful gift. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.
we certainly want to thank you for coming out to worship with us today. And our time of communion is always a great time to just reflect on, on what God has done for us. Um, before I allow you to escape a day uh, today, uh, we do have some announcements that we want to share with you. Um, as Katie mentioned, uh, VBS is coming up just around the corner. And it seems like we're in early summer. As school hasn't even been released for most places yet. But VBS is like three weeks away. So um, you need to get in touch with Aiden. Uh, or you can go to the information station or track down Katie today since Aiden's not here. And get in touch so you can find your way to volunteer for VBS. Um, which will be June 5th through 10th. Also, um, Camp Sayokomo, uh, dates for those have been released. So if you look at that screen and you have a kid or a grandkid that's interested in Sayokomo, um, mark that date on your calendar and make sure that you let Miss Katie or Miss Aiden know about that so we can get your kids registered for that event. As was mentioned uh, by Bruce, today is Mother's Day. If you are here, you have a mother, all right? Uh, someone... <laughs> Someone brought you into this world, somebody put up with you, and we owe a great deal of gratitude towards those who have put up with us for, uh, well, for my sake, for my entire life, all right? Uh, and so if you are a mother, we want to recognize you today. As you exit in the foyer, there are some flowers out there. Please make sure you take one of those. And I want to say this as well. Um, if you are a lady, we invite you to take one of those flowers as well because we recognize the importance of, of what you do in a, in a family and for those around you. And so we want to say thank you to all of you wonderful moms out there. Thank you for all of you that have been moms, even if you've never been a mom, that you have been a mom, and make sure you have that flower. Hey, we're going to go ahead and close out today, so would you go, Greg, what are you laughing about? <laughs> My phrasing could use some help? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, will you, will you stand as we uh, sing a final song and dismiss? <laughs> Miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are, 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 that is who you are.